It's very often helpful to look at poetry in terms of a kind of balance of opposites between the negative elements of the poem and the positive ones. So I'd like to look at Keats's Ode to a Nightingale from that point of view. Let's start by taking a close look at the first stanza of the poem. My heart aches, and a drowsing numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leafy woods had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, like winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. There's a very clear contrast going on here between the negative words in the first part of that opening stanza and the positive words in the second half. More than that, though, there's a pattern here. The negative words all relate to one thing, and the positive words all relate to something else. Can you see what I'm talking about? Perhaps you could pause the video for a moment and see if you can see any kind of pattern here. Did you notice anything? For me, the thing that stands out in this opening stanza is that the negative words all relate to the poet, and the positive words all relate to the nightingale. But it goes even further than that. We can see some very specific contrasts between these two groups of words. The most basic contrast, perhaps, is between the word pains in the first half of the stanza and the word ease in the second half. And we can see other contrasts, dull and light, emptied and full. Dryad, representing the spirit, and sense, the world of the physical body. And if you look hard enough, you'll find more contrasts of this kind. Try it and see. In addition to the lexis, the choice of words, the contrasting elements of this stanza are signalled in other ways. For example, the alliterative of d and dr sounds of drowsy, drunk, dull, and drains all work to create a sense of something heavy, pulling the poet downwards towards Lethe, the river of the underworld, while the nightingale is a light-winged dryad, rising upwards. But let's move on here and take a look at the second and third stanzas of the poem. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim, and purple stained mouth, that I might drink, and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So again, we've got a clear distinction between the positive side of the poem in the second stanza and the negative side in the third stanza. This time, though, it's not just the nightingale and the poet that are contrasted. At the time that he wrote this ode, in May 1819, Keats had not travelled outside England, and his portrayal of the warm south in the second stanza is pieced together from things he had read and from his own imagination. The nightingale is a migratory bird, 
spending the winter in Africa. So uh, to Keats's mind, it represents a warmer, more cheerful world than the one he inhabits. I've picked out the words mirth from the second stanza and sorrow from the third stanza as representing what seems to me to be the central opposition or contrast between these two stanzas. But just as in the first stanza, we've got a number of very specific contrasts and oppositions going on here. The dance and song of the world of the nightingale contrasts specifically with the world of the poet, where men sit and hear each other groan. Equally, the world of the nightingale is a colourful world, with its green and its purple, and this again sits in specific contrast with the world of the poet, which is grey and pale. As a final example, we could look at the temperatures in the two stanzas. In the world of the nightingale, the wine is cooled, and Keats talks of a beaker full of the warm south, whereas in the world of the poet, we have the uncomfortable temperature, the fever. At the time of writing this poem, Keats had not yet shown symptoms of the tuberculosis which would put him in his grave less than two years later. However, he had witnessed a tremendous amount of death and suffering, partly during his medical training at the Royal College of Surgery, and partly through the deaths of members of his family, notably his brother Tom, who had died of tuberculosis just a few months earlier. Keats was all too familiar with the weariness, the fever and the fret that he writes of in the third stanza. Again, I've just given a few examples of the contrasts going on in these two stanzas. If you take the trouble to search for them, you can no doubt find others. In the fourth stanza, the poet now leaves behind his world of sorrow and misery, and in his imagination he enters the world of the nightingale. And here, the pattern that we've seen so far of positive and negative begins to break down slightly. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his paths, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. In this stanza, the positive and negative aspects don't correspond quite so neatly with the poet and the nightingale. Some of it is what we might expect, with, for example, tender connecting clearly with the nightingale, and the dull brain that perplexes and retards connecting with the poet. But it isn't all quite like that. The poet will fly to the nightingale. So a positive quality gets connected to the poet. And the world of the nightingale is a world of no light, a world of glooms. From that point of view, the central image of this stanza is perhaps the image of the viewless wings of poesy. This image unites the poet and the nightingale. Through poesy, poetry, the poet can enter the world of the nightingale and be together with the nightingale. So now the poet enters imaginatively into the world of the nightingale. It's a world of darkness, a nighttime world, so he can't see it, but instead imagines what it might be like. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming muskrose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunts of flies on summer eaves.
The nightingale's song stands out more in the night time when other birds are silent, but the nightingale also sings during the day, and it seems, both from the opening lines of the poem and from the account Keats's friend, Charles Armitage Brown, gives of the circumstances under which the poem was written, that Keats was listening to the nightingale during the daytime. Now, though, he has apparently slipped into a kind of sleep, or perhaps even a trance, and is in transported in his imagination into the nighttime world of the nightingale. So all of this stanza is the world of the nightingale, or at least how the poet imagines the world of the nightingale. And it's worth noting that along with the positive imagery, there are some uncomfortable images. Embalmed darkness, the haunt of flies, that word fading. Not entirely negative perhaps, but tending towards the negative side. This blurring of positive and negative becomes even more evident in the sixth stanza, where the poet imagines that he could escape his world of misery and pain forever by simply dying. Dying right at that moment as he listens to the song of the nightingale. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. So we've got what is possibly the biggest opposition imaginable, the opposition between death and love. But Keats doesn't emphasise the opposition. Rather than making love positive and death negative, he says he is half in love with easeful death, and he uses a whole range of words to try to make death seem attractive and positive. We may feel it's a bit strange that death would come into the ideal world of the nightingale, but when we consider that for Keats, death is an escape from the pain and suffering of this world, it makes a kind of sense. But there's something else that Keats finds in the world of the nightingale, something that breaks the spell and brings him back to the real world. Before we go on to the last two stanzas, let's just take a quick look at what we've got so far. There's a basic opposition between happiness and sorrow, with the nightingale representing the world of the spirit and imagination on the side of happiness, and the poet representing the world of sense, the world of reality, on the side of sorrow. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown, perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. So what's happening here is that even in the world of the nightingale, the poet finds sadness, sickness, peril. The fairy lands are forlorn. The world of the nightingale has its own unhappiness, its own suffering. Keats cannot escape from the suffering and pain of his world by going into the world of the nightingale. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is fain to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu. Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision? or a waking dream. 
fled is that music? Do I wake or sleep? I'm giving this section the heading Resolution, but I don't want to imply that Keats resolves the tension between the opposing elements of the poem. I'm thinking of resolution here more in the musical sense, the point of rest, the balancing point on which the theme of the poem resolves itself. Keats doesn't reach a, a happy conclusion, but neither does he reach a sorrowful one. Keats realises that unhappiness is not just something of this world where men sit and hear each other groan, but the fairy lands of his imagination are also at times forlorn. And once he realises that, the world of the nightingale fragments. And as the bird flies away, the poet is left in a state of confusion. What was that? What happened? The poem ends not with happiness or sadness, but with bewilderment. Do I wake or sleep? If you enjoyed this, please watch my other videos on poetry, especially those on Keats and the other romantic poets. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. And if you're able, join as a channel member or follow me on Patreon.